For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand and burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to listen to your word this morning, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to open our hearts, Father. Not that people would hear my opinion on your word, but we would hear your word and how practical it is for our everyday lives, Father. I pray that those that are um, in a place of despair this morning that need to be encouraged, Father, I pray that they would find encouragement in you. And I pray that those that need to be saved this morning, I pray that they would, uh, Father, that they would turn from their sin and they would embrace you as their Savior, Father, and they would trust that you would save them. And Father, I pray for those that are going through uh, difficult times, and whether it's personal relationships or whether it's their mental stability and health, Father, I pray that, God, they would realize that you have the answers to all of these things. Yes. And we pray, God, that you would just be with us this morning. Father, there's no way I can know all of the needs that are, that are out there and where everybody is at, both physically and mentally, Father, but you know. And you care. And Father, you offer that you, we can come to you. That we can take our anxieties, we can take our fears, and we can cast them before you. Because you care for us. Right. What an amazing thing, Father. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we talked about before, what you've got to realize, and I want you to take a moment and try to, you kind of try to put yourself in this place. The king is either dying or is already dead, and you're not really sure because if you go through the if you go through the history of Israel, you would realize that they were there was never been a nation that has been so directly tied with their leadership, and it wasn't like we get to do today. It wasn't like okay, well, um, King Uzziah had passed away. Now we're going to have this. Uh, we're going to have these debates. We're going to figure out who we want to be in leadership. And we're going to uh, vote who we want to have in leadership. And it's going to be a leadership of the people. That's not how it worked. And in fact, when you look at the kingship of some of these, you would just, you would almost be praying that the, uh, that the king's firstborn wasn't an idiot. Because that's going to be your king eventually. Right. So... It was a very unnerving thing when you had a good leader that was now gone. And Israel being directly uh, tied to the character of their leaders, they were a nation of extreme ups and downs when it came to leadership. They would have a leader that would honor God, and God would honor that leader, and they would be prosperous, and they would do, they would do great things, and they would be, they would get back to the roots of honoring God, but then they would have a leader that didn't know God, that would lead them in the wrong direction. So here we've got Isaiah being a prophet of God, being a mouthpiece of God. He is going, he is going to speak to the people. He's getting a vision. And when it doesn't matter whether King Uzziah had just died or was about to die, what matters is that God is speaking to Isaiah either right before or right after a tragic loss. Some of you this morning are listening in and your King Uzziah has just died. Or some of you are listening in and your King Uzziah is on his deathbed. The uncertainty of tomorrow is crippling you today. You being worried about what the, the uncertainties of tomorrow or the uncertainty of next week or the uncertainty of this life and what it's doing is it's crippling you. But we've got an opportunity today. We've got choices that we can make today. 
that we can decide that we're not going to allow the enemy to cripple us with the unknown of the future. Just like the song says so many things about tomorrow, I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Amen. That's the reality is we don't have to worry about tomorrow because I need to worry about having a relationship of God that holds tomorrow in his hand. I need to worry about having a relationship with a God that sits outside of time and that is able to deliver me or able to let me perish. Whether I live or I die, I'm in his hands. That's the comfort that we can take, not in worldly leadership, not in the uncertainty of tomorrow, but I I need to take leadership and the author and finisher of my faith, the one that is able to feed all the birds of the air and able to do it without breaking a sweat. But notice the first thing that Isaiah Isaiah sees. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. The Lord is seated on the throne no matter your circumstances. Amen. Amen. He is seated on the throne. You see, worldly leaderships change. Culture changes. People change. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still seated on the throne no matter the circumstance. And notice that the Lord is seated on the throne no matter what the culture looks like. The Lord is seated on the throne even when a member of your political party is not in office. Amen. The Lord is seated on the throne even when life happens, even when the doctor calls you with bad news, even when the uh, your bank account does not translate into what you feel like you need to get through the month, the Lord is still seated on the throne. We have to agree that he's either sovereign or he's not. That's right. Man. He can't only be sovereign when we're in the mountaintop, but he has to be sovereign when we are in the valley. He's seated on the throne no matter where you're at. He's seated on the throne this morning if your marriage is falling apart. He's seated on the throne this morning if you are riddled with the destruction of your dependency on a chemical substance. He's seated on the throne if you are in a place of despair, if you are in a place of depression this morning, if you have a wayward child, if you have a cheating spouse, if you have financial issues. God is seated upon the throne. He never ceases to be in control. There's never a time that or a circumstance that happens that catches God off guard. And sometimes the knowledge of this fact is what you need to get through. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Many of us, it's it's a control issue where we feel like we need to do something. Well, now what do I need to do? I need to make sure that I'm I, I'm doing this. I need to make sure I've got plenty of supplies. I need to make sure that I'm I, I'm, I'm I'm social distancing. I need to make sure, and this is all a feeble attempt to control something that we really can't control. And we're brought to the reality of something that has always been true: is we cannot control anything. Right. We certainly can't control our time here on this earth. We are not promised tomorrow. That's always been the case. But we've been comfortable in the fact that we feel like we can control our health, that we can control the, the things on this earth, but we have no control. Right. And what God, if you hear nothing else this morning, God might be saying to you this morning, just be still and know that I'm still on the throne. Amen. Just be still and know that I am still God, that the one that was able to split the Red Sea and allow the Hebrews to walk through on dry ground, the same God that came and lived a perfect life and was able to defeat death and hell to save you from yourself and reconcile you to a holy God. He says, be still. I'm still that God this morning. Even in the midst of a pandemic. 
And, and just hold on, because once this whole thing is over, there's going to still be the uncertainty of life. Yep. We just had in our community yesterday, at Walmart, full of people that are concerned about a virus that could kill them, and all of a sudden somebody gets shot. Yep. Those kind of things can happen. Because the reality of it is, is we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is cursed. It is cursed because of the sin of man. Yep. But God is saying, be still and just know that I am God. Be still and just trust me. Even when logically you don't see the other side. Even when it doesn't make sense to you, even when you don't want to trust him, be still and know that he's still God and you can trust him. The disciples, and the disciples saw this when they were in the boat and there's a storm and there's a storm brewing and they go and they get Jesus and they say, do you not care that we're going to perish? Do you not care that we're going to die? And he stands up, peace be still, everything's calm. And they say, what manner of man is this that even the seas and the winds obey him? That's God that's seated upon the throne. Amen. That with but a word can speak peace and can control the weather. Right. Be still and know that he is God. And notice what he's doing. He's sitting on the throne. He's not pacing back and forth. He's not wringing his hands and wiping the sweat from his brow. No, he's seated because he can be. He's seated upon the throne. In fact, James McDonald notes in his book, The Will of God is the Word of God. God accomplishes his sovereign will with his feet up. He could rule a thousand universes like ours and never be taxed or tired in any way. That is the God that we serve. Hebrews 2, 8 says, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Amen. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. You, you're never in a time that's out of his control. He's seated upon the throne because he can be. He doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to get stressed out because he's sovereign. And I want you to note next is note his worthiness. High and lifted up. Amen. My ask of you this morning is what are you focusing on? Are we focusing on the trials of life? Are we focusing on the, uh, the issues at hand? Or are we focusing on the Lord high and lifted up? Because I'll tell you, friend, when you actually get a view of who God really is, not the God that our culture has made him out to be, that he's this glorified Santa Claus that we can place on the shelf until we need him and then take him off the shelf and don't grant us our wishes. No, when we actually try to wrap our heads around the God that spoke and everything came to be. Amen. If we believe in the Bible, if we believe that this word is God breathed, breathed from God that spoke everything into existence, don't we think that he's just powerful enough to sustain us and to take care of us and to know what we need? Amen. If he is a God, that as Romans talks about, calls into existence the things that do not exist and brings dead things back to life. If he's that powerful, don't you think that he knows how to deal with a puny little virus? Amen. I'm not downplaying the fact of that 
It's scary when we, and, and it's sad when we start to lose people that we love. Right. But that's nothing new, folks. Right. That's been something that has been a rain cloud over all of mankind since the Garden of Eden. Right. But it's not God's fault. It's our fault. We chose sin over God. And still today, we choose sin over God. And this earth is cursed. And we have to deal with losing people. We have to deal with the curse and the heartache of this life. But God promises that if you'll seek after him, that he will reconcile you to himself. It doesn't get rid of the curse. But it does promise that one day we will live with him and we will be delivered from all of the curse and everything that the curse touches. Amen. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. Friends, this is not just a fairy tale thing that makes you feel better about losing loved ones. This is a reality. True. Amen. How do I know it's reality? It's because the God that spoke everything into existence, the God that has made some promises and has never not delivered on his promises, promise of that place. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Right. And Jesus is basically calling upon his relationship with the disciples. I like how personal Jesus is in that moment. He said, you've been with me. We're best friends. If it were not so, I would have told you. Have I ever lied to you before? And we've got to call upon our relationship with the holy God that even when we don't see how his promises could be true, he's never lied to us before. He's worthy. He's high and lifted up. If you, if you lift God up, if you get a view of who God really is, I'm telling you, friends, the things that are overwhelming you in your life, the obstacles that are overwhelming you in your life, they don't seem very big when in comparison of a, the vastness of God. He's high and lifted up because he's above all things. He's above all things. Ephesians 4, 5 through 6 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and all. Amen. He's worthy to be praised. Psalms 145 3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. You want to search for how great God is? You can't. It's unsearchable. Right. <laughs> Come up with every adjective that you can to positively try to uh, try to wrap your head around the greatness of God and we can spend the rest of our lives talking about how great and awesome and mighty and powerful and we can spend hundreds and hundreds of years and we don't even scratch the surface of who he really is. Amen. His greatness is unsearchable. Friends, I am glad to proclaim to you this morning I don't have the answers to life's problems. Yeah. I'm glad to proclaim to you that when it comes to dealing with issues on this world, I don't have the answers, but I know the one who does. Yep. And he is the one whose greatness is unsearchable. Amen. And it also says in Isaiah chapter 6, the train of his robe filled the temple. This is a picture of of how honorable he is. Amen. If you ever go back and you can research pictures like this, don't do it right now. 
but you can go back and you can research uh, when they when they when they have like the the Queen of England is a big one when they when they are anointing her or whatever it is that they do I can't remember right now but uh, but the, she wears this train and it comes down and it goes all the way back and what the the what that symbolizes is the honoring the longer the train the more honor honor that person is when you go to a wedding and you see a bride and she wears this train and it goes back and she's got to have people that are back there trying to make sure it doesn't get wrapped around the chairs or whatever the case may be that's the whole point and I'm sorry to say this to you, husbands, if you haven't figured this out, but that day is not about you. You don't get a train. <laughs> You're just standing up there with everybody else. Nobody stands up for you. Right. It's for her to honor her. And notice the train of his robe filled the temple. Take the train of his robe, go back and forth, fold it over, up into the ceiling, up into the heavens, up into forever and eternity. That's how honorable he is. Man. His train doesn't only fill the temple, it fills the earth, it fills the heavens, and it goes on for all of eternity. And again, just like the wedding it's not about me as the groom. It's kind of reverse in our heavenly relationship that it's all about the bridegroom. Amen. It's all about him. It's all about the honor and the glory and the things that he has done for us. His train filled the temple. comforts me so much Amen. to know that that God though he's that big and though he's high and he's lifted up that he asked me to come boldly before his throne of grace right. that that God that spoke everything into existence that everything is under his feet I can call him daddy and I can come to him and I can cast my cares. Or as ESP says, I can cast my anxieties on him. Not because he'll take into consideration what he'll, he'll throw me a bone. It's because he cares about me. Amen. And notice above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I want you to notice the activity that's going on around him. Unceasing praise. If you don't like to praise and worship God, then you probably won't like heaven very much. Right. There's constant around his throne, unceasing praise. And praise is not about the actions as much as it is the recipient of your praise. Right. We talked about this a little bit about this morning when we are worshiping together. It's not about me. It's not about who's sitting next to me. It's not about how the praise and worship time makes me feel. It's about me not having anything else to offer but my worship to a holy God who could have left me to myself, that could have left me to my own, but he came and he rescued me. Amen. I saw, I saw a meme a couple of weeks ago and it said, uh, and it had these people and they were coming to the pastor and they say, Pastor, we didn't really enjoy the praise service this morning. He said, well, that's okay because it wasn't for you. <laughs> Who is our praise for? It's for him. Yeah. In our attempt to say, thank you for not leaving me to myself. Thank you for not abandoning me, though I, though I deserved it. Thank you for not uh, just 
leaving me here by myself, but rescuing me. And praise is not about inviting God to enter into our presence, but it's about entering into his presence. And when we enter into the presence of God, we can't help but praise him. And when you truly enter into the presence of God, your immediate response should be much like the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Amen. The whole earth is full of his glory. Amen. The repeating here of holy, 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 when you would repeat something three times, you might as well say it for all of eternity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And once you're in the presence of God, you get a true view of who he is. It goes on in verse 4, it says, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and that house was filled with smoke. The foundations shake under the mighty presence of God. We need to get a true view of who he is. Amen. A true view of what he's capable of. Because when you get a true view of who he is, you get a true view of who you are. And this is, and, and I want to paint the picture for you. Isaiah is here, and you've got these seraphim, and they're, they're, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And again, the other cries out to the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The foundations are shaking. His train fills the temple. Smoke fills the temple. And he gets a true view of who God is. And this is not just so some average Joe here. This is a prophet of God. This is one that has been chosen to be a mouthpiece of God. And he gets a true view of God. And notice, once he gets a true view of God, he gets a true view of himself. And all pride leaves. And, he's, and in verse 5 it says, And I said, notice, woe is me, for I am lost. Yep. I am lost. And if you study that passage a little bit, what, is, what, what Isaiah is saying, woe is me. He literally is saying, I'm about to be torn apart. I'm about to be destroyed. For those of you that think that, well, when I, when I get in front of God, I'm, I, he's going to have to hear from me. He's going to have to explain himself to me. No, because you will get a true view of who God is. And God is not the God of your imagination, but God is the God of the Bible. And when we view God and see him in his glory, all we can say is, woe is me, I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Amen. Woe is me. I'm about to be destroyed and I deserve to be destroyed because are you kidding me? I'm in this, I'm in the presence of a holy God and I get a view of who he is and I am unclean. I'm unclean and the people around me are unclean. I'm about to be destroyed. I am coming undone. And as we talked about it, as I talked about Friday, it's not about your effort. Your effort is no good. Right. You can never be good enough. If we were going to compare our relationship and the impact and the things that we were that we have done, friends, I promise you that Isaiah had done way more than we could ever do. Right. And here he is in front of a holy God, and he's saying, I'm about to be torn apart. I am an unclean man with unclean lips. And us 
trying to somehow earn the favor of God is just feeble attempts for us to try to clear our conscience. We can't earn the favor of God. Right. He says, I, I'm an unclean man, and I am of unclean lips. There's, there's a lot of hopelessness in that statement. Because he's not begging for God not to destroy him. He, he gets a real view of, I deserve to be destroyed. I deserve to be torn apart. If we say, why do bad things happen to good people? We're operating under the assumption that there are good people. Right. And there's not. We're all selfish. We all seek our own glory. We all seek for our own self. You may be a little bit better of a person than I am, but you know what? You're still lost if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior. But then we see a beautiful picture. We see a beautiful picture of the redemptive power of Christ. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. At this point, Isaiah's terrified. I'm about to be destroyed, and I deserve it. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, for your sin is atoned for. You can't be good enough, but Jesus was good enough. Amen. Your sacrifice is not sufficient. His sacrifice is sufficient, and he is the burning coal. God is saying, take this burning coal, take the redemptive power of what Christ did for you on Calvary, and he says, touch it to your lips. Your guilt is taken away. In fact, the Bible says that he takes our sin and he casts it as far as the east is from the west. And he doesn't just gain amnesia and, 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 and all of a sudden forget your sin, but it says that he remembers them no more. He doesn't keep bringing it up. He doesn't treat you like just this this rotten person that, that, that now somehow has, he justifies you. He restores the standard, justifies you, just as if you'd never done it. Amen. That's the way that he forgives. He restores the standard. He doesn't bring it up. He doesn't get in an argument with you and, and, and hold on to it one day where he can bring it up and beat you over the head with it. No, in fact, he says that his mercies are new every morning. Did you mess up yesterday? Well, good news is we serve a merciful God that His mercies are brand new today. Good. And then he asks a question. As many of you may be listening to that, you say, hey, I agree with all that. I love the fact that, that I have accepted that burning coal from the altar, that I've touched my lips, that my guilt is taken away, and my sin is atoned for. But it does not stop there. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who Go for us. Have you had the benefit this morning of having your guilt taken away? Mm -hmm. Have you had the benefit this morning of being able to say that your sin is atoned for? Do you have the benefit this morning of waking up and saying that my God's mercy is new today? His grace is sufficient for today. He's going to carry me through this thing. I, I can cover my sin and my shame and my guilt under the righteousness of Christ. Do you have that benefit this morning? 
Well, God is still asking the same question. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Notice his question is not who is capable enough or who is talented enough. You see, because God's focus is not on your abilities, it's on your heart. Amen. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not, not what as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Thank goodness that God doesn't only use talented people. Thank God that He doesn't just use attractive people. I would sure be let down. He doesn't look at you like people look at you. He doesn't look at you like people that consistently say, well, you can't, or you're not able, or you don't have the capabilities. In fact, that's the beautiful thing, that God uses us in spite of our downfalls, in spite of our shortcomings. And he takes people, and he, he elevates them in a place to where we can't, we can't take any of the credit whatsoever. It has to be God. And he's asking that question, who shall I send and who will go for us? He's asking, who's going to go? Because there are people, whether we have a pandemic that goes on or not, there are people that every single day enter into eternity not ready for it. And there are people that every single day die and go and, and are separated from God eternally in hell. Every single day. Right. And we have the message. We have the answer. We have a way that they don't have to do that. And God is asking, who will go for us? But you have to be you don't have to be talented. You don't have to be attractive. You don't have to. Do, you don't have to have a lot of money. You just have to be willing. And Isaiah says, "Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Are you willing to give it all for him? It's very popular in our current church culture that it all becomes about me." It all becomes about my needs and how I feel and the way that I want to be used. Well, I feel like um, I need to be able to, to uh, minister to thousands of people. But we minister just to the one? Yeah. Are you willing to go? Well, I feel like I need to be important and in leadership. Or are, you, are you willing to shrug the toilets if that's what God right. wants you to do? Right. Are you willing to cut the grass if that's what God wants you to do? Are you willing to teach children's shirts if that's what God wants you to do? Because it's not just a little bit about him. It's all about him. Friends, I'm not concerned that our ministry here at Victory Baptist Church would be defined by the millions and millions and millions that we impact. I want our ministry to be defined by the fact that we sought what God wanted us to do, and we did it. Simply that. Because I'm not concerned with going down in history as, as people that would be remembered by the earth. I just want to be remembered by my God. Amen. Are you willing to give it all for the one that gave it all to you? Everybody bow your heads with me. Lord, I submit to you this Father, I can, I can fess up to the fact that I don't always give you my all. You deserve better than that. Father, I admit to you this morning that 
that there are things that I put in my life that that I that I that I seek and I try to and I try to grasp and I and I'm motivated to try to somehow gain these things, Father. But in eternity, they they're meaningless. Forgive me for that, Father. Speak to our hearts. Father, I pray that a new fire would ignite within the church, within the congregation of God's people, that we would realize, if nothing else, Father, we're not promised tomorrow, and there are people that need to hear the truth today. It's not about me being comfortable. It's not about me being fulfilled in my life. It's about you being glorified. And Father, though I may not... Yeah, it may, I may not be remembered in the history books, Father. I want to be remembered by you. And I gave all to the one who spared no expense to save me. And though I can never pay you back, I can give you what I have. This life is all I have to glorify you and honor and tell all that it's about, about you. I can never pay you back for what you've done for me, Father. But this is all I have, and I give it to you now. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your blessings. We pray, God, that you would be with our pastor in the next service, Father. We pray that you would anoint upon him the message that you have given to him, that we would hear it, Father, and not only hear and agree, but, Father, it would challenge us to be called to action. Don't leave us here by ourselves. Don't leave us stagnant. Don't leave us comfortable, Father. If you have to take every provision away to get a hold of us, do it. Yeah. All we need is 